Birthright was originally intended as a one-episode outing about Worf, but Michael Piller felt that there was more story here than that, and buoyed by the successful expansion of Chain of Command, convinced Rick Berman to do the same thing here. However, while there was more material for one, there wasn't enough for two. Hence the need for a B-plot. This brings us to an interesting situation. This was the first time that they had a B-plot in part one of a two-parter, but that did not return at all in the second part. And while both are unified by the implication of the term birthright, the first part is far more known as the Data episode, and the latter far more the Wharf one. For that reason, I'm going to handle this two-part story a little differently. Today, I am completely disregarding the Wharf plotline and going solely with the Data one, and next week, I'll be covering the Wharf part of Part 1 alongside the entirety of Part 2. As I said with the aforementioned Chain of Command, the original plan for that story was to have a crossover appearance by Deep Space Nine, but it didn't work out. So Birthright basically gives a second chance for that as the Enterprise is docked there so that they can help rebuild some Bajoran aqueducts. Thankfully, that is not the focus of this episode. Infrastructure is important, much like the colon is, but unless you are into that sort of thing, it doesn't make for exciting television. They have a relaxation program here, Jean-Luc, from all tour seven. Listen to this. First, they bathe you in a protein bath. Well, you know, Beverly, if you ever need protein slathered all over you, I'm your man. Back on the ship, Data notes some kind of power drain, so with Geordi and Worf off on the station, Data gets the job of going and seeing what's up. He can assess like Geordi and strong-arm people like Worf. Being an android is like being dual class. Turns out that it's Dr. Bashir. In the script, it was supposed to be Dax, but since this was changed late in the game, well, time was a factor, so Bashir got put in there instead because he was bumped off early and move along home. Sidig would thus be more free to do this B-plot on TNG. This actually makes the episode quite interesting, because there is an undercurrent to his performance that benefits from the later revelation about his genetic background. Right now he's using the Enterprise systems to help with his experiments with this new Gamma Quadrant technology. Believe it or not, the Enterprise computer is a bit more advanced than the one the Cardassians put on the station that was meant to process ore, so that's why he's here. Data is intrigued enough with the implication of the device, though, to suggest doing a proper examination of it in engineering rather than hacking into the sick bay like this. You're not back at the academy trying to hotwire the replicators into making weed for you, Julian. So they start tinkering with the device, and while they're working on that, Bashir starts asking questions from Data. Does your hair grow? Do you breathe? Do you have a pulse? He doesn't ask if Data is fully functional, which you know Dax would have asked if she was here. He notes that Dr. Soon went to a lot of trouble to make Data seem more human, even though he has superhuman abilities. Or, if you want to put it another way, every effort is made to make Data seem like an ordinary human, just like anyone else. But below the surface, he is in fact stronger, faster, and smarter. You can see why our genetically enhanced doctor, who hides his strength, speed, and intellect, might find that amusing. Anyway, they try experimenting with the device, but there's a power surge, and it finally zaps Data. When that happens, Data shuts down, but also, he has a vision of himself walking through the corridors of the Enterprise, where he's drawn to the sound of pounding metal on metal. He finds Dr. Sung working in Anvil, but before he can ask what the hell is going on, Jordy pulls him out of it by restoring his consciousness. There's no explanation for this. Everything says that Data was completely shut down, but he insists that despite this, he can remember seeing things. Bashir approaches this in the context of what he's noted, about Sung's effort to make Data human-like in so many of his aspects, that perhaps this is along those lines, a dream or hallucination. He can hotwire a replicator if you want to experiment with that second one. Uncertain how to approach this, Data asks Worf for some advice, since he did something like this once before. Yes. When I was young, my adoptive parents arranged for me to partake in the rite of Mushka. Mamushka! Mamushka! He comes with one mushka! It makes more sense than the original Klingon. 
After Dave explains what happened, Worf says that such a powerful vision demands that he find out what it means. So Data starts digging into it, eventually asking Picard for help, who agrees because it's not like he's got any protein to give Beverly right now. Data explains that he's been digging through different cultural meanings and philosophical treatises to try to make sense of it, but no dice. The hammer, for instance, has several meanings. The Klingon culture views the hammer as a symbol of power. However, the Takwa tribe of Nagor sees it as an icon of hearth and home. The Ferengis view it as a sign of sexual prowess. Yeah, let me stop you there before you give me any further mental images that can't be scrubbed away. Picard thinks Data's approach is backwards. He needs to look at it from the point of view of his own culture, even if that culture consists solely of himself. Picard suggests allowing the vision to inspire Data and see what comes of that. And boy, does Data go to town with it. Jordy comes by and it looks like Vincent van Gogh had an orgasm in here. There's paintings all over the place. He takes Jordy on a tour of his one-man art show, first of what he had directly witnessed, and then things not seemingly related to it. Smoke from a bucket, a bird's wing, a bird, a flock of birds, even a feather. He has no idea why they came to mind, though. So he wants to try the experiment all over again, because he thinks if he had stayed longer, he would have learned the meaning of the vision. Jordy is hesitant because that could be fatal. Basically, then, this is Barge of the Dead, but not about Klingon religion, so it's perfectly fine to go ahead with this. And thus, Jordy reluctantly agrees to help Data go zap himself again for science. So, once he's been zapped, Data again heads up the corridor and finds Dr. Sung working the anvil. But what he is making is a blackbird wing. When he's done dipping it in the water and the steam comes out, Sung is gone, but there's a bird sitting on the workbench. Presumably the customer here to complain about the job being behind schedule and over budget. Data's confused by the change from the first vision, but Sung says that that's the point. Because Data is dreaming. Think of it... Think of it as an empty sky. I do not understand. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Just dream, Data. Dream. Data. You are the bird. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Well, that explains that then. Seems that there were a series of circuits intended to be activated at a certain level of development, and the machine has triggered them. Now that it's happened, Data intends to regularly shut himself down to offer a whole new kind of exploration. Thank you, Data. And sweet dreams. This episode resonates with many people, so much so that there was a disappointment that Data's tale did not continue in the second part. Indeed, that POV of Data flying around is so powerful that it overshadows the rest of Birthright. Whatever Worf does, it can't compare to this. Because we have followed Data on a long journey, more than five years by this point, of trying to achieve a personal dream of attaining humanity. I use that word because he himself said in Hide and Q that this was an illusion. The idea he could truly be human. It was fantasy. It was an impossible wish, a goal that exists for the pursuit alone. To be in the form of a human, to be shaped by human ethics, to possess practical activity which mimicked natural human action. This, I think, gives Data a framework, a means to evolve because he has something to evolve towards. In that pursuit, Data, more than any other character, has studied and practiced art, Yet what are the works that he often creates? When he performs music, he imitates others. When he acts, he imitates others. When he writes poetry, he follows constructed rules written by others. Think about that. His approach, not creation, 
but the reproduction with minor variation of others. Like a circulatory system that pumps fluid that is not blood, breathing that is used to regulate temperature, Data's efforts to seem human are imitations of what humans do, for his own reasons. A poet doesn't write to become more human, but to express their humanity. Remember Data's approach to the dream was to study what other interpret those symbols to mean. But to dream? To dream is to break away from that, because it's something Data cannot copy. As I said in Kino's journey, Dreams are the ultimate solitary activity, a fiction played to an audience of one. It is within dreams that Data can be anything, can do anything. Data has dreamed to be human since he came to life, but when the time came to actually dream, that's not what he became. He became a bird, because to be a bird calls to mind the word Free. Free as a bird. It is in dreams where all the need to emulate can dissolve and leave behind the true freedom of data to express himself, to feel that he is indeed a culture of one, as Picard described him, and not an outsider trying to slot himself into the culture of others. Striving to be human is a process towards his evolution, not the end point that he must attain. He must be free to become whatever it is that he feels he should be. The episode implies this activated prematurely, but with the growth that we have seen from him, Data is indeed ready for this. And the episode resonates with people because we are along on that journey, and through Data, experience the wonderful sense of the shackles falling away, to feel that rush beneath us and an open sky above us, inviting us to forget tomorrow and yesterday and just live in this moment where there are no consequences, no responsibilities, no worries, just that empty sky beckoning us with the assurance that for once, you're not going to fall. There's a reason why the term describes both this phenomenon and also being a synonym for wish. For this is a place where, for a little while, our greatest hopes can be realized. It is in attaining this universally human state that data has become open to possibilities that can let him most become himself. You can boost the power output to 65%. I am sorry, but use of sickbay equipment is limited to ship's medical personnel. 